Hey guys, Bradley Hallman here. Welcome to the channel. Man, I've got a really, really special show for you guys today. This is gonna go right in line with a lot of the other uh, co-angler series that I have already done. This one's another interview that I've got another buddy of mine that has got a tremendous amount of experience out of the back of the boat. And when I say a tremendous amount, this guy's got lots of tips and ideas for you guys. This guy has won over $374,000 out of the back of a bass boat, and that's only on the MLF, FLW side of the boat. Um, this guy's got like seven wins. He's got 24, 25 top tens. Um, this guy knows his stuff. He's a good friend of mine. I've been fortunate enough to draw out with him twice. I felt like he had a lot of information that you guys would really, really like to hear and stuff that you guys could use to help up your game in the back of the boat and really, really compete at a high level of what I call the back 180. So um, guys, without any more talk, let's get right to it. Here's Keith Honeycutt. All right, dude. Uh, I, I've gone through your stuff. I'm really excited to have you on here, man. This is a big deal to uh, to have you here with me, Keith. I really appreciate you doing it, dude. I, I was going through today when I, whenever I was getting ready for you to come on. I, I clicked up your stuff and uh, I started at Bassmaster and then I moved over to, uh, to, to FLW or the MLF now website. Dude, you got like seven wins. You got like 20 something, 25, 24 top tens. I mean, it's a lot. Yeah, I've been I've been blessed, you know, um, Hallman, I, I grew up fishing, man, wading the creeks, not wanting to go to school, not a very good student. And uh, I just uh, kind of followed my passion, you know, uh, not really at the level that I would like to be at for my age right now. But, you know, kind of kicking it off and telling you how I got started, man, I got a good, good break in 2007 when I won the Strand Series championship and um you know, when you're, you know, late 20s, early 30s, and you're fishing around the house and you're not winning very much money, it's 100 bucks here, a couple of, you know, Tuesday night tournaments. And then, you know, um, I actually made the championship for the Strength Series Championship in 2007, and I wasn't even going to go because I, I own and operate a landscape service, and, and um, just my guys were not all showing up, and I go to eat at my grandparents' house, and my grandfather said, man, did I ever tell you about the time uh, back in Mobile, Alabama? And I, like, stopped eating, and I said, you're from Mobile, Alabama? He said, yeah. And I said, well, that's where I'm supposed to be going tomorrow. And he said, I know. That's why I'm telling you. He said, you're going to go down there and win this tournament. And I, my grandfather was a real hardcore worker, like eight to five, go to college, no yeah. bull." you know, no cutting up during the week and fishing wasn't going to get it. And you're hunting too much and you need to, you know, scale back and you need to think about work. And uh, I ended up winning that tournament, winning $65,000. And, uh, but you know, um, I caught two fish the first day on spinner bait and I was thinking, man, I suck, you know, two fish for four pounds. Why the hell am I even down here? I knew I shouldn't have come to this thing. And then I drew Ott Defoe the next day. You know, Ott, he's just as easy as anybody could be. And he said, hey, man, you got a chance. And I was like, dude, I'm way out. And he goes, no, dude, you got a chance. Anybody's got a chance fishing on the river. And so uh, we pull up to the magical log. And um, I, we catch like 13 keepers off this log. And I catch like 12 or 13 pounds the next day and I make it into the top 10. Hallman, they never zero out the weights. Never. They zeroed out all of the weights for that tournament. And it was like one day weight wins on Saturday. And I caught a limit on a shaky head behind Nick Ganey that weighed like eight and a half pounds and won $65,000. And I was like, I mean, I didn't know who the hell to call. My dad was on like the 14th green putting, and I called and I said, hey, I just won this thing. And he go, well, let me call you back. And I go, no, I just won this tournament. And he was like, oh, my God, how much did you win? I said, $65,000. So, you know, man, I, got, I was very blessed. I took that money and put it into a bank of account. And, man, I've never fished on, uh, on my personal money again, you know, just because of the things I've won. I've just – replace the money into my fishing account well, drawn off of it that's what i was going to say i hadn't even added your bass to this but i mean you're you're well over four hundred thousand dollars in career earnings got to be between bass and flw because you got 375 right there at, uh, at flw so um 
that's not a, a bad chunk of money to uh, make out of the back of the boat, son. No, at all. It's, uh, which is exactly why I wanted to have you on here because you've got lots of advice, lots of pointers. Um, you've been doing this a long time. You fished in the back of the boat with some of the very best fishermen in the country. I mean, you have, and uh, you've seen how they carry themselves. And that's kind of what I try to get across on this channel to a lot of these guys. And why I do this co angler series is because I want to empower them out of the back of the boat where they don't feel like, you know, it, it's not all just made up on the draw the night of the meeting. Um, drawing the best local on the best home lake is not always the best draw, which I know you, you're aware of. Um, there's, there's many things that go into that. And really, you know, it does come down to their level of skill as a bass fisherman and being able to read water in different bodies of the water. And you're a guy that's traveled all over the country to numerous different types of water. So you've had to learn all different things. I mean, coming from Texas, um, you are down in the Austin area next to Lake Travis where it's really clear. So you do get some of that. And then you've had some grass and stuff, but really you cut your teeth traveling around on these, what are they, Toyota series nowadays, yeah. you know, but um, you've got five wins in the Toyota series alone and another two wins on the FLW tour. Yeah. Um, dude, that's just incredible. So um, I'm going to quit talking and let you explain some of the mm -hmm. tips and ideas that you got. Um, I know that well, you're I, I'm afraid the co-angler uh, the co-angler deal is, is becoming a dime breed. You and I've talked about this. I've had the opportunity to fish with you a couple of times and um, it's sad. Um, there's a lot of people on the tour level MLF level that have cut their teeth as a co-angler. I mean, Matt Airy, second place, Bassmasters Classic finisher, Scott Martin, um, you know, just a dominator. Um, uh, Brian, Justin, New, Brian, Brian New. Brian New. Yeah. Justin Lucas. He, Justin Lucas. How about Stetson Blaylock? I mean, you yeah. can I, you can go down the list and, um, you know, looking back at like 2008 to 2013, if you look at some of the co-anglers who are there, all those guys are like fishing the big leagues now. Yeah. And it's like, wow, could I have gone that way? Yeah, I probably could have gone that way. Could I have been that successful? Well, I don't know if I'd have put as much time and effort in it as they have. But you know, Holman, I, I run a rental business here and I've got a bunch of rent property that I've bought and and I own a lawn care service where we mow 300 plus properties every single week and it's hard mm -hmm. for me to get out the door to go fish and a lot of the times um I get on a plane Wednesday morning and I drop down at Wednesday at lunch and I jump in a rent car and I hurry to the meeting and um go check in and run back out to the car and start rigging my reels on my rods and then go to the meeting, get something to eat, go to where I'm staying after I draw my partner and, and try to figure out how I'm going to catch them, you know? Yeah. And uh, I've been fortunate to be around them, but I'm going to tell you this honestly. I've had some draws where I wasn't around them that I've let those guys know in the front of the boat there are other ways to catch them besides on that spinner bay or on mm -hmm. that jig or on a yeah. top water. And then they're like, oh, dude, you got any more of those worms for like tomorrow? And so – so anyway, um, just been real fortunate, man. I got a good break early on practicing with Clark Winlet, uh, practiced a couple of years with Clark and, um, the guy is as good as anybody 10 foot and less never really fished deep with Clark. So it was spinnerbait, chatterbait, topwater, Senko, just 10 foot and less. And so what year did you think you started fishing with Clark? Man, I'm going to say maybe like 2008 or nine, probably. Maybe even, yeah, 2008 or nine. We were actually, the way I met Clark is I uh, was, FLW had this deal called Texas Tournament Trail. It was the best thing going. I remember and, that. Uh, that day, uh, Russell Cecil made a ton of money on that thing. He but and a lot of other people did too. And if you were a ranger boat owner, you got priority entry. And so uh, I was in a skeeter. My parents said, you got to get out of that skeeter. You got to get in the boat that's going to pay you. And so I actually made a top 10 at Travis and I met Clark there. And uh, of course that being his home lake. And so he, he and I just kind of struck it up, started talking. And I said, man, you need to, you need to come down to where I'm at. I'm only an hour North of Austin and you need to come dove hunting down there, man. We got great places to dove hunt and do. I mean, his eyes lit up. So he and I started dove hunting a bunch together. And then he got me on a ranch. We were hunting in Mexico and we traveled back and forth. And 
Um, he taught me the Mexico hunting ropes down there and then it led into the fishing and you know he's uh he's just got a great family and he's a great guy and he's a hell of a fisherman and i'm telling you you talk about a guy that gets to the ramp at dark and leaves at dark i mean yeah. i can remember staying with him in florida sometimes and he's saying man where we're gonna put in you need to be here at like 3 45 or 4 and i'm like 3 45 in the morning and we would leave and it would be an hour and we would get there 30 minutes before light and we would put in and we would sneak off and we would fish all day. And it was a job. I didn't really realize that they went out there for that long early on, you know, in my career. Yeah. I just thought that hell everybody showed up six, seven hours worth of fishing. And then we rocked on. <laughs> yeah. No, it's it daylight to dark, you know? Yeah, it is. And I know Clark pushes it a little further than some of the others for sure, because I don't get there 30 minutes before the sun comes up generally, but I find, you know, some of your techniques and things that, that, that we're going to share with this video, you don't practice. None. Gen generally speaking, you show up, you fly in generally, and you fly in the day of the meeting and that afternoon, and you try to make it in time just to get to the meeting. The reason I brought that up was just because before, when you were with Clark, that was a time frame that you were really spending a lot more time on the water and at these fisheries and kind of got that basis, right, of learning some of the fisheries. Right. Um, across the country and, you know, spending a lot of time there, that, that had to be a huge learning curve for you at that point. But then, right. Like now you don't, you don't practice at all. None. Like I'm uh, just ship my rods today to go to Champlain and it's going to be a great break for me, but I'm going to fish the Northern division of the Toyotas uh, this year. And um, I've missed, didn't get to go last year because, you know, obviously COVID, and so I love it in New York. It's some of the best fishing bar none that we can ever go to. Uh, those fish get don't get as much pressure down there, but I ship my rods today for $57. You uh, FedEx ground, they'll go to the hotel where I'm staying. I'll fly in to, uh, I think I'm flying into Albany. I'll get in a rent car and I'll drive three hours over there. I'll give me two days of competition up in a place where I love to fish. I'll tear down all my tackle at the hotel Friday night. If I don't make it on Saturday, I'll put the tag on there. FedEx picks my rods up, brings them back to me in five days. Wow. And I go back home Saturday night or Sunday morning and I'll go right back to work on Monday. So and, is, is the purpose of mailing it, is that because it's cheaper or just don't have to mess with them with the airplanes or? I, you know, early on, um, I was taking my rods and I would fly Southwest to places that I could fly into Southwest because your tackle bag and your rod tube counts as one piece of luggage. And then I would take my clothes as the other piece of luggage. And then I would take my Bass Pro Shop backpack loaded down with tackle that I would need on my back mm -hmm. as my carry on. And, um, it took a little while to figure it all out, but I've got it mapped out pretty good. And nowadays with the way traveling is, man, it's just as easy not to, um, it's just as easy to ship your rods than it is to carry that big, long seven and a half foot bazooka tube in a, in a midsize rent car. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, I think it's easier. It gets to the hotel and I don't have to transport it through the airport. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So your, your philosophy on not practicing, right? So you're showing up the night of the meeting. You obviously feel like that helps you in tournaments. I mean, a guy that's won seven events with as many top tens as you've got, it's obviously working for you. I, I think it benefits me. You know, you take some guys, and I know I keep throwing Brian New out there because Brian and I were friends when we were on the co-angler side, but he practiced with, you know, Brian Thrift, all yeah. those – all those times and he had it narrowed down and it was like, man, I've done a little bit of homework and I've already been to this lake two times and I know they're going to be doing one or two things. And even if my partner's not doing this, I'm still going to have a shaky head on, or I'm going to have a trap on, or I'm going to have a top water on and I'm just going to do what I like to do. And if I catch them, Hey, fine. If I don't, I'll go home and go back to mowing yards and make more money than I probably was going to make fishing anyway. But anyway, I just think, um, me not having a predetermined deal in my head. Like if I'd have practiced two days with you and you spent all your time flipping and then I draw a guy out throwing a Carolina rig down by the dam, it's like, well, 
yeah, I got to see how you practiced and how you caught them, but it didn't benefit me in the tournament. So I would like to go in there just kind of thinking of how I'm going to catch them. It makes all the sense in the world. It's, 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 it's being able to stay open-minded. And it's like what I talk about in my videos, I'm always talking about the back 180 and, you know, that's to empower people's mind because right. the one thing they have power of in the, as a co-angler is when that boat stops, you know, that's what's there, whether it's the middle of the lake and it's an offshore ledge or it's up in the bushes flipping. And you're right. I mean, you see a lot of guys that that's a, that's a downfall that they have because they go with the guy and practice. They practice for a couple of days, even at a BFL level. And say they're flipping bushes and then the first day of the tournament or the night at the meeting, they draw a guy that's like, Hey man, we're fishing offshore all day tomorrow. I'm just dragging a Carolina rig. And you know, they're like, <sighs> you know, yeah. I know you're going to catch 20 pounds in the bushes and we're going offshore and there's no fish out there. We practiced out there, you know, and we never got a bite. Well, the truth is the guy you practiced with spent 90% of his time on the bank and 10% offshore and he didn't find them. And yep. the guy, you know, I, I, know. I, to I totally get that where it'll, cause it, it doesn't matter to you you're going to be dumped anywhere, right? So you've got yeah. to be open-minded about it. And I, I think that's a, that's a valid point. I think, early on, I think early on, I was in it for the learning. Like, I wanted to fish at this level. I wanted to know what it was like. I read Honey Hole Magazine and Bassmasters and FLW, and I read all those, and I saw all those pictures, and I was like, man, I fished with that guy, fished with that guy. I did good here, did good there. But then again – after the couple of years, it was like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm through, not through learning, but like, I want to win now. Like I got to do things. I got to, I got to fish deeper to win, or I got to fish slower to win, or I don't need to match you in catching fish. I don't need to match your cast or the amount of fish. I just need to pluck one off every now and then. And then, you know, just catch a limit every day, you know, Five fish are very important on the co-angler side. Absolutely. It's, it's a huge deal, especially in the multi-day events. Um, they add up one after the other. And then you get tournaments like what you were talking about, that you the first one that you won where they take away the weight. Dude, that's huge, you know, just to make the cut, be in that group, and whoever catches the biggest bag that day wins the event. Um, so I met you at Table Rock uh, probably – I don't even know what year it was. A few years ago in a, in a Costa Championship or Toyota Championship, whatever they mm -hmm. want to call them now. And um, I, right out of the gate, was staying at a house with a lot of FLW pros um, that had drawn you before. And first thing they told me was like, dude, that guy can catch them. You know, you better be on your toes because he can catch them. Talk about some of that with some of your success that you know that you kind of had to butt some of that controversy. Um yeah, it's with with guys in the boat that knew who you were or they heard through the grapevine. It's it's um it kind of sucks, Holman. I mean, it's like um you you know I have fished with you a couple times and um I'm aggressive, but I'm not but you and I aren't fishing for the same purse and right. we're not even fishing for the same fish. It's like if if you're flipping that beaver up there, I'm gonna be mad, I'm gonna be flipping right behind you you're moving the boat forward and i'm going to be a little bit aggressive and if you're not aggressive you're you're not going to win i'm, I'm just going to tell you if you think dragging a worm behind the back of the boat is going to win you a tournament eating a candy bar with you you need to be you need to it's not going it's just not going to work i agree with so, you and i i think that um i kind of I'm not gonna say I got a bad name, but I just think that people would say, dude, he's, he's aggressive. Like he yeah. can catch him, but you know, he's, he's aggressive and not aggressive in a bad manner. I think I only had one really bad, really, really bad ordeal happen to me. And 99% of the guys that I have fished with will tell you at the end of the day that, Hey man, I had a great day. You're a really good fisherman. I don't know why you're on, not on the front of the boat. You need to be on the front of the boat. And I just, I take it as a compliment, you know, I, I you know, I, just, I try hard. I'm, I'm not going to half-ass it to any, you know, doing anything. How do you, how do you go about your days? Like staying mentally hooked up, even if it's like what you're talking about, you know, it's maybe it's even the end of a day one and you didn't catch what you, you wanted to catch. Right. And you're, you're having to go into day two, or if you're fishing a one day event and it's, it's 11 o'clock in the morning and you got a two thirty weigh in and you don't have squat in the boat. How do you stay mentally hooked up? 
Well, first of all, you know, as much as we want, and you and I've talked about this before, fishing is not everything. It's a, it's a very small part of our life. And yep. in the days, at the days in, you're not going to catch them every single time. You, you've got to know that as a co-angler, you're going to be paired with somebody that's not around as many fish as you would like to be around. But you just got to take, take a learning experience from that particular day or an event and then take it and carry it on. Like a lot of guys would say, like if they only had one fish at two 30, they'll just wrap their stuff up and sit down and just say, you know, just mark it up. But I didn't catch them. And I was like, dude, you could catch three in the last 15 minutes and it could make all the difference in the world. We always fish for points. So when I was fishing the tour and on the Toyotas, it's like, dude, you're fishing for points. Like every fish counts. Mm -hmm. So you have to continue to cast and cast until the end of the day, until that guy picks up the trolling motor and tells you, dude, reel it in. We're going to weigh in. You've got to keep firing every day. I think the mental part is a huge part of it. And um, this is kind of a story that reminded me of what you were talking about the very first time that you won and you were thought to foe. He kind of did the same thing for you. I've had, a, I've had some co-anglers in my boat before. And I, I, I mean this with all, everything I got, like guys always want to know what the secret is in fishing. And, and after you get to a certain level, it's up here mm -hmm. and it is believing that it can happen. Yeah. And I've had you in the back of my boat in two different events and you believe the entire time you fight to the very last second. Not many guys do that. And you've been with a lot of pros that don't fight to the very last second. Exactly. But I had a woman one time who knew nothing about fishing. And, uh, she told me early in the day about, um, all these anglers, big name anglers, great anglers, had that she had drawn out with. She'd been fishing as a on FLW tour quite a bit. Her and her son or grandson, something like that. She was an older lady. And um, she really wasn't that good of a fisherman. I shouldn't be saying that on this. Somebody may chime her into this because she was a savior. We were on Beaver Lake and it was day two. It was the year that it flooded. You remember when it came up like 25 feet from practice yeah. to the tournament yeah. days? And I didn't catch squat the first day. And I wasn't catching squat the second day. And I mean, dude, it's like noon and I got a three o'clock way in. And she's back there just telling me how great I am all day long. You know, she's been following my career. She knows all about me, how great of an angler I am. And she's just blah, blah, blah. And I'm up there and I'm pretty hum ho on myself. You know, this place sucks. It's Beaver Lake. And I'm not catching them. And I'm on this bank. It's a real steep 45 degree bank. And I'm I got a spinning rod out. And there's three boats in front of me all doing the same thing. You know, we're all spinning rod down this 45 degree bank. And I, I, she just keeps talking. And I looked over at the other side of the bank and I thought, man, it's springtime. And I'm over here on this steep rock bank and across the pockets, the flat side of the pockets, you know, you got a steep and a flat. And I was like, if I just showed up here, open-minded, right? Like what you're talking right, about. Right. If I just showed up here and hadn't fished at all or practiced, would you be sitting over here with this spinning rod in your hand and this little worm? And I was like, no, I sit down and put everything up in my boat, every rod on my deck, which there was like 30 of them. I look like I can nearly, <laughs> I put everything up and I grabbed a frog, a spinning rod and a flipping stick. And I was like, if I'm going to go out with my complete tail kicked, I'm going out my way, yep. even if it's the last three hours of the day. And I go over there and I pick up that frog and it was like magic, honey cut. I, I've never seen anything like it. I, one blows up and I'm like, damn, I caught a fish. And I ordered a beaver and this is like a three and a half pounder. I'm like, that's a pretty Big good it. one. Yeah. And she just starts. See, I told you, you have time. And I'm thinking, I don't have time, lady. I got like two and a half hours and I got one bass in the boat. I don't make 20 more skips that frog underneath the tree and poof, another one eats it. And she just, see, I told you, you're going to do it. And dude, by bite number three, I'm believing this lady like a hundred percent. I'm the greatest angler that's ever walked the planet. Just like she's back there telling me. It was very much like what you were talking about when you got in the boat with the foe and your very first win. And he's saying, dude, you ain't out of it. You can win it. You know what I mean? And, and that is correct. And so when those are some of the great things that happen with, boat or co-anger relationships in the boat the second time that i drew you was the same thing um it was my home lake grand lake the water was in the bushes i didn't have a great tournament when it was all said and done but i did cash a check and i salvaged yep. you and i the first day i'd had a decent bite flipping it wasn't great grand was a grind and you had me down four to nothing mm -hmm. and dude i took some tips from what you were doing i asked you what size weight you were flipping you were flipping a lot lighter i sat down changed and my day picked up and we both caught them and we got out of the boat in the, the day, but I'll never forget, man. Like I'm, it's down to the last 30 seconds of the day and I've only got four, 
and uh, I make a flip on like the last willow tree on the row. And when I set the hook, man, I swung it over the rail of the boat. And when it hit the bottom of the deck, I'll never forget. You said, get your ass in here and That's let's right. go to the house. I think I unbuttoned that fish and threw it in the live well for you. Yeah, and you raised yeah. the, I put the jig on the eye and you strapped your rods down. But dude, you got to be a, you know, I'm, I'm a good cheerleader for the guy in the front of the boat, especially if the guy in the front of the boat is trying to, if we're trying to work together right. and um, man, it just makes the day so much better. You know, you get a chance to travel the world and, and fish with people that you don't know and you become good friends with them. And um, I just like a good solid day of fishing with a lot of positivity. And even if we're not catching them, let's keep moving. You know, let's, if we're not, if we can't catch them under the docks, well then let's go to the, to the wood. And if we can't catch them in the wood, well, let's go throw a crankbait, but let's keep trying. Let's just don't give up. Tom, and I can't tell you like maybe two or three of my wins um, have been kind of credited to myself because two of my wins on Rayburn, um, I've had co-anglers tell me that, dude, if you've got a place where you feel like you're comfortable going, you just tell me. And I'll never forget, I drew um, oh, Ray. Um, oh, Ray's from uh, Amstead. Oh, uh, man, you made me go blank just then. Ray, Ray, Ray Hanselman. Ray Hanselman. Let me tell you this. So I draw Ray Hanselman, and we go – fishing and he said dude i'm catching them on a trap and i like i'm thinking to myself i ain't gonna throw no trap i'm gonna throw a swim jig okay. and so and this is a true story and um so i throw a swim jig and i catch like a three and a half pounder and it's cold it's brutally cold and i catch like a three and a half pounder and then i catch another three and a half pounder and then he starts paying attention when he's netting my fish like you know what i'm catching them on well, I caught a big bag that day, and I think I was leading the tournament. The second day guy tells me that, hey, I just caught three fish, and they only weigh 10 pounds. We'll go do whatever you want to do. So I go to the opposite end of the lake and do the same thing in some stuff, and I catch another good bag. He doesn't catch much, but I catch another good bag, and I make the final day. Well, then the third day, um, I mixed in some spots of my own with his spots, and I end up winning the tournament. And I'm, I'm driving home, I'm thinking – Man, what if I didn't, what if I wouldn't have spoken up? You know, what if yeah. I wouldn't have gone over to these spots? And it it happens. A lot of co-anglers will tell you that some of the boaters, I don't call them all pros, but some of the boaters will tell them, hey, look, if you've got something, we, I don't mind hitting it at some point during the day. Mm -hmm. Because you're going to learn something. If you trust in him, you're going to learn something. And it may come back to help you two tournaments down the road if you ever go back there yeah but. It, it it goes both ways from the front of the boat there are days where i've kind of got my game plan and i'm going to do it no matter what right because like i've spent my time practicing my money and i've got a game plan that i want to do from beginning of the day to the end and i'm not talking about just grinding on one stretch or doing just one thing but i may have three or four different patterns that i want to check in the end of day and mm -hmm. and Guys have got to understand that. There's going to be guys like that. I've also been that guy, exactly what you're talking about. I led a BASS event uh, right out of the bat. Uh, it was an open, um, probably like 2004 or five, and it was up on Lake Norfolk, which was a really tough place. And I drew a guy, it was an older guy, and I knew at the meeting that night that, that he knew his play around that place. And um, I had a nice start to the morning, and, I, and he and I were having a good conversation, and he had a couple good fish, and I said, you got anything that's close to here? And he said, yeah. And I said, I don't want to run like 10 miles or something, but because we're going to come back through this little honey right. hole and milk them. But, you know, if you got something close, dude, let's hit it. Yeah. Well, he had something close, and let me tell you, he had something, something. Uh, it mm -hmm. was like 45-foot deep house foundation, and every time our football jigs would even come within five foot of that thing, they would. it felt like Sammy Sosa cracking the bat that hit that jig so hard. <laughs> and we both loaded the boat, dude. It was an incredible day. But uh, See, that's what I'm talking about, you know. Yeah. And yeah. that and that will help you down the. That will help you. That kind of helped you get over maybe not believing the co-anglers. And you have to think back, like, 
man, I got to take a chance every now and then. And you, I, I think some of it comes from experience too, right? Like you yeah. can kind of feel out throughout the day Oh yeah. how much that guy really does know and how much smoke he may or may not be blowing. Yep. And, and I can tell pretty quick, you know, but I mean, we've been doing this a while and, um, but yeah, I agree a hundred percent. It can go both ways that both of you can help each other. And, uh, like I say, that, that mental positivity in the boat goes both ways for both yep. of you in the water, as far as working together. What other big pointers do you think of just like top two or three, just off the top of your head for guys that are fishing, you know, maybe not fishing the coastal level, but just, you know, fishing BFL levels or federation stuff. Man, you can catch so many fish on a spinning rod. And, you know, you, you, you know as well as I do, you can put the same dang line on a bait caster, but there's something about that spinning rod. And whether you throw a shaky head or you throw a drop shot, um, prime example, uh, Gary Haraguchi, guy from way out west, California. Yeah. I'm, he and I are um, pretty good friends, and I saw him at the boat ramp one time, and I've always wanted to meet that guy because he is a keen drop shotter. And I was like, man, I would really like to know more about the drop shot. I mean, every tournament, um, that drop shot catches him. Palman, I don't care if you're flipping wood, you can still catch him in a drop shot. Or he can go on the other side of the boat, and it's still a drop shot. You can catch him in the winter, the summer, the spring. You can put a, a wacky Cinco on that drop shot. You can put a little shaky head on that drop shot. It's, it's a killer. I mean, around grass – if you can just get them hooked up and just don't try to horse them, they, they'll usually stay on. And uh, the spinning rod is just detrimental to a co-angler. I agree. I mean, it's, it's – uh, God, man, I've won a lot of money on that dang spinning rod. So, you know, that would be one, one, of, one of the things that I would say. Um, I kind of like to take a chance every now and then. I like I, I kind of like to tie a spook on, you know, when somebody may be doing something else. I like to tie a top, big top water on and maybe catch a four or five pounder. Yeah. Maybe, not, maybe yeah. not catch four or five keepers, but maybe just catch the right one, you uh -huh. know? Yeah. So, um, you know, that would be, you know, just be open minded. You in the back of the boat, you got to be open minded. So, what do you think some of the biggest mistakes you see Coingers making? Uh -huh. What we talked about earlier, you know, them practicing with somebody that f fish shallow for three days and then they draw a guy that's going to throw a Carolina rig out on the tips of a bunch of sandbars and they've already got a bad taste in their mouth because it's not how he and his partner fished and now he's got to cut all of his line off and all of his braid off. He's got to take his jigs off. And it's like, dude, just be open-minded. If you'll just be open-minded, it can work. I promise you it can work. I've been one of those guys where, you know, I'm staying in a house full of guys like y'all, and everybody's catching them sh shallow around the grass, and then I've got a guy that's wanting to go out deep, and I'm like, golly, I can't believe this guy can't figure it out. I mean, I've got five guys I'm staying with that have figured it out, and I draw the only guy that hasn't figured it out. But then I go out there. And I start catching them, and it's like, see, this is what I get for being lopsided, you know. Yeah. And you yeah. have to be open-minded. And then I get to thinking, after drawing that guy the first day, that's what the same thing I would like to do the second day because not many people are out there doing it, and I probably got a chance to win out there. I don't have a, a chance to win fishing shallow. So it's like, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a learning curve, you know, because a lot of co-anglers come to – being a co-angler because they have their own boat at home. And so they get to be the guy that runs the trolling motor. So they're aggressive on their home lakes or they're aggressive in their bash champs tournaments like that. But when you get in the back of the boat and someone else is dictating where you fish and you can catch them, then you're a good fisherman. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. You know, you have to adapt to the situation and just be open-minded. You know, I would tell, I would tell co-anglers, um, man, be prepared, you know, like keep a pack of worms in your pocket, keep some hooks and weights in your pocket. Don't, don't have to set your rod down and, and get in the back box and dig through your whole backpack to find stuff. Have a clue of what's going on. Prime example, we were at a uh, Harris chain and I catch them on this little bitty worm made by Yotamoto. I catch them all over the country on this thing. It's a little grub. And um, I started catching them like really quick. 
And um, I would just lose that worm and I just whip out that deal and put another whip out my pack and put another one on and fire out there. And that guy turned around, and he says, Is that the same one? I said, No, I've gone through like five worms. And he is like, Well, you're not like getting into the box. I said, dude, I got hooks and weights and worms all in this front pocket right here. And I said, over on this pocket right here, I got a swim jig, a jig to flip with, and uh, a zoom speed vibe, you know, that I can switch out and and he was like, I could see him up there shaking his head like, yeah, I think you got it figured out. You know, you're yeah. a little bit more organized than the, than the ordinary guy. So, Well, that, that leads into one of the biggest questions that I get a lot on this series is how much tackle do you carry and how do you condense it down? How do you get down to where you're not carrying – because you're obviously not carrying every color of the worm under the spectrum and all that. You know, um, blacks and blues and browns keep it pretty simple. I mean – you know, uh, I've looked in your jig box before, and your jig box is blacks and blues, and then the other yeah. side is browns and browns yeah. and oranges. And there's a hundred different sizes in there, but there's only two different colors in there. Yeah. So I just keep try to keep it simple. You know, green pumpkin, watermelon, and then black, blue, uh, blue emerald. Um, I just keep it simple. I mean, I can I can take that Bass Pro Shop backpack of mine, put four little clear boxes in the bottom, put five or six backpacks, I mean, uh, five or six Ziploc bags in that middle with my hooks and my weights, throw a few spinner baits in there, a few chatter baits, throw the backpack on your back and just go fishing. I left to go to the James River after we completed the Toyota series one year. I asked my buddy to travel with me. I said, let's go fish the Northern Swing. And he goes, okay. So I show up to the airport and I've got, that time I was flying Southwest, so I took my rods. So I had five rods in a shipping tube. My reels were in my backpack. All my tackle was in my backpack. And I had one little duffel bag of clothes. And he goes, dude, where's your tackle? And I said, all my tackle is right here on my back. So we're going to the James River. I said, you need a swim jig. You need a black and blue worm. You need maybe a top water. And I said, everything I got is right here. And I never had to go into town to buy any tackle or anything. Wow. And I ended, up, I ended up winning the tournament down there just on what I had. And if you make yourself fish with what you have, uh, you'd be surprised how many fish you catch. Absolutely. I mean, I, I totally get that. I, I find myself ordering tackle all the time. There was a point in my life where every event that came up, I was making a two, three hundred, four hundred, five hundred dollar order of tackle. And after years of that, you're finally like, this is silly. Like, I've got more tackle in my garage than some tackle stores have got. If I can't catch them with what I've got, then I don't, I don't I need to be fishing. You know? it's, it's crazy. I look in some of those guys' boats and I'm thinking, man, I don't even know how this boat planes out with all <laughs> that tackle right there. Yeah. So, yeah, I just, you know, uh, I, try, I try to travel light. You know, I'm going to, like I said, I'm going to Champlain and I won't take much. I'll take some stuff in case I draw somebody that goes to Ticonderoga, uh, you know, some swim jigs and Cinco's and frogs, uh, maybe a chatterbait and spinnerbait here or there. But for the most part, you know, I hope to get to go smallmouth fishing. And, uh, you know, take some jerk baits. It'll be at the end of the spawn, you know, so, you know, a Ned's going to work and a uh, shaky head's going to work and um, Carolina rig is going to work. And so, you know, I won't need a lot of tackle. I know that uh, what you said earlier about a guy that can catch a fish behind somebody else uh, on a body of water that they're not familiar with. And, you know, that guy can fish. And I totally, totally agree with that. One of the comments that I get a lot of times or questions that I get is like, when is it, when is it? Cause everybody's always in this huge hurry, no matter what age they are, whether they're 20 years old or they're 40 years old, they're always in this huge hurry to go from the co-angler side of the boat to the boater side of the boat. Mm -hmm. And I, I tell all of them, I'm like, man, this is like a once in a lifetime opportunity. And kind of once you make that move, there's really no going back. And you know, you're a perfect example of there. It has so much to do with the quality of fisherman you are out of the back of the boat. This thing is not luck of the draw. Um, yeah. you're, the, over your right shoulder there is living proof. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's impressive. And guys to get in such a big hurry, and I see so many guys make that just jump way too, too quick. Um, I feel like that there's, there's a lot to be learned back there. Um, I, I totally agree. You were telling me some stories earlier. I mean, some of the guys that you'd fished with, uh, one of the events that you won, one of the FLW Tour events you won, you won on Grand Lake. And yeah. you actually fished with Jason Christie, who won the same event. 
And, you know, that was a flipping event where you're flipping, you know, um, behind a guy that doesn't pass up much, you know. Um, I'm sure that day when you draw him, you're thinking, eh, he's going to be around a lot of them, but there's probably not going to be a whole lot left. But, dude, you, you won the dang event. I had a I had a great tournament. That was a that was a May tournament, kind of a post spawn tournament. And I first day I drew a Brandon Coulter and a great guy. And I started off and I think I caught like 21 or 22 pounds behind him on a square bill. And he didn't know he he was extremely happy for me. He really was. But I could tell it was killing him too, you know. And uh so the next day I draw David Fritz and I catch like 15 or 16 behind Fritz throwing a throwing a crankbait. And I'm like, golly, man. And then I went in and I had like maybe a four or five pound lead. And then the next day I kept watching like in FLW, like they match you number for number. So if you're number two, you're going to go out with number two or number one. Bass doesn't do it like that. Bass kind of shakes the can up and yeah. they, they do a draw. So I was watching Christy and, you know, obviously Christy's like the um, hands on favorite there. And then so at the top 10 meeting, it's like they introduced us. And I was like, I didn't want to be starstruck. He's just a guy just like you, you know, damn good fisherman from Oklahoma, just doing what he loves to do. But in the, in a little bit of me, I was like, oh, my God, dude, I've got like Jason Christie. You know, and everybody was calling and texting. But he told me that morning, he said, you know, I was trying not to talk and just kind of taking it all in and he said you're going to have an opportunity today and don't try to match me just fish just fish the way you fish and he said we're going to be flipping and he said we're going to have a lot of boats behind us and I said okay so man after about the third or fourth time he set the hook and I hadn't caught one I was like dude I am I am stuck back here. Like yep, yep. he's pitching at all the good willow trees, but I, I kind of remembered what he said. Just, just take your time, figure out where I'm not flipping and, and just pitch. And so I started doing it and I caught a couple of keepers and then we come up to a little log jam and I pitch in there and I catch like a six pounder and he was scrambling to help me get that fish in the boat and he got it in the boat and we had probably 40 or 50 boats following us. And it's a good story, Hallman, because we, I have three and he goes, how much weight do you think you have? And I said, man, I think I have like three fish that weigh like maybe 10 pounds. He said, how much of a lead did you have? I said, five. He said, so you've got really, you got 15 pounds. And I said, no, really I got 10 pounds. <laughs> And he says, well, how much do you think you need to win? And I said, 15 or 16. And he said, okay. So you could tell he went down through there and he was still catching them. I wouldn't catch him. And we round the corner and he said, now I think Andy Morgan's going to be around this corner right over here. And if we get around this corner and Morgan's got less than 16, I'll take you to a place where I think you can catch two. I said, okay. So we get around the corner and Christy says, well, how much you got, Morgan? You know, Morgan always downplays it anyway. He probably had more than what he had. He said, oh, I think I only got about 14. Dude, I strapped my stuff up, threw my rod down, put my life jacket on. I said, that sounds like less than 16 to me. So, Christy did. He fished for about 30 more minutes, and, and we ran way down the lake, and he pulls up on this flat spot, and it's the same dang spot that I had fished the day before with David Fritz, and I had already been there. And we were going down the bank, and I'm thinking – oh my God, surely he's not going to pull in on this little flat corner right here. He pulls in on that flat corner. I didn't even take my life jacket off. I jumped up, undid my square bill, fired out there, first cast, three and a half pounder. Got him in, slung him in the boat, second cast, three and a half pounder. I had my five, put him in the well, and he goes, I think you're going to win. He said, now I have an opportunity to catch a big fish up here by Marina. And I said, I'm all in, and I don't think I fished the rest of the day. So That's awesome, man. He, he did it. He did it for me. There's no doubt. Um, I might have could have caught one or two more up there behind him flipping, but it was all 100% him leaving his fish to help me. And I told him, I said, dude, you're going to win the tournament because you did something great. And he did. He, he ended up winning, and I won. So it's a great story. There's a lot of those guys out there homing just like that. Yeah. That don't mind pitching in and helping when they can. Yeah. And, and um, you know, and there's a there's a 
just a handful of guys that are not like that, which it's, it's okay. Sometimes situations are different. I, I remember one event I had a coin that was like, I was sight fishing and he was like, man, I had a Todd Castledine one time and he was pointing out the ones that, 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 that he couldn't, uh, that he didn't need. They weren't big enough. And the funny thing was the week before we were sight fishing and I was doing that exact same thing for my coin who won that yeah. event on day three, but it was a different situation. We were at a different lake. This was at Texoma and there wasn't very many fish. It was just kind of one here and one there. And it wasn't right. a place where there was just a whole bunch of them, you know, lined up the bank where you could go down the bank and go, there's a three pounder. I don't need it. Get it. You know, but uh, yeah, I, I totally agree. There's a lot of guys and it goes both ways. Um, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you doing this with me, Keith. Um, sure, man. I appreciate you're, it. You're a phenomenal co-angler. You've got tons of knowledge to share with these guys. You and I could probably go for three or four hours talking like this. Um, I enjoy hearing all of your stories and all the different experiences that you've had through life. And, dude, super proud to be a buddy of yours and, and uh, can't wait to travel with you sometime when we hit the same deal or run into each other or draw each other out again. Yeah, yeah. We've had some great times together. Room. I've roomed with you. I've got to room yep. with you and a bunch of guys. And it's – you talk about a bunch of knowledge. I, I, just a quick story. I, I'll tell you, we were um, staying. It was you and um, me and um, Brian Smith and mm -hmm. Billy, Billy Shelton and one or two more guys, and y'all were all through with y'all's tackle, and y'all were all sitting around in the living room after you'd cooked everybody's steaks that night. And I was scrambling to get on my tackle. And I was like, my gosh, all the chattering about fishing. And y'all just all had your little place in the living room. And y'all were all kind of just feeding off of each other just a little bit about how it was all going to go down for the weekend. And, yeah. man, I think that's so important. And, and there's a lot of guys that do it like that. But oh, yeah. it's, it's really fun to be in the mix with guys that are really good fishermen and know what the hell they're doing, you know. I always I know it's tough when you guys that is one of the worst parts you know you're talking about scrambling around in your tackles when you're a coingler like you just don't know what you're going to tie on until you go to that meeting and get some idea and it keeps you guys up late at night when a lot of the boaters are done with their tackle and oh yeah um, I've witnessed that quite a few times yeah well dude like I say thank you very much for being on here I appreciate it guys if you're first time here you've never watched any of my stuff on YouTube please bump that like hit that subscribe um this is something that this channel's different, dude. I'm, I'm trying to do things to help you guys. I got guys like Keith that I'm buddies with, and they're nice enough to come on here and share a lot of their knowledge and information that you're not just going to hear anywhere else. Um, you're not going to read about it in magazines or anything because they just, quite frankly, haven't written that many articles on on co-anglers, right? I mean, I'm sure you've got a few written, but they don't. They just don't do it. So um, this is a special opportunity for any of you guys that have ever thought about being co-angler. Keith and I both encourage you to do it. Enjoy the experience. It's all about the right attitude and trying to make the best of a day. And it's a great, uh, it's a great experience. I mean, you know, if anybody's thinking about doing it, I mean, it's a little bit of money, just a little bit of money to learn a lot in a short amount of time. Yeah. And, and if one thing I would tell the co-anglers, man, share the expense, the daily expense with your boater, um, you know, giving 40 or 50 bucks. I mean, that's, for oil and gas and and stuff like that it goes it just goes a long ways you know and yep. i know a lot of people say that they don't expect it but we as co-anglers i always i always pay my guys because yep. i own a boat and i know how expensive it is so yep. you know it's it's uh it's very important as a co-angler to share the expense yep it is. And I'd say that, you know, it is about 95% of the guys that do and probably even higher than that. It's probably like 99. And, you know, it's just like everything in life. When you get 200 people out there, there's going to be one or two and, and everybody's got their own reasons, but don't let something like that hold you back guys. I mean, like the co experience experiences, it's legit. And uh, guys like Honeycutt here, are hammerheads at it. So uh, <laughs> professional co-anglers is what we <laughs> coined them on tour for sure. Keith, thank you very much, bud. Appreciate You're welcome, it. Riley. All right, guys, we're out of here. Mm -hmm.